to unit four. Today we're going to be moving on with our negotiation class and we're going to be going into kind of the real detail now of negotiation. We're going to look at the different types of negotiation and we're going to focus first on two types but today we're going to stick to one type. The type we're going to be looking at today in fact is distributive bargaining. Distributive bargaining. Let's think of this as a basketball game. I think I mentioned this the last unit but let me bring it up again. It's a really great example. Every time one team makes a score, what do you get? You get two points, right? Uh, two points for one team, but what about the other team? Do they get two points? And the answer is, of course not. If you get a basket, you get two points. The other team does not get two points. Do they lose two points? No, they don't lose two points. However, if you get two points, I get no points, you're two ahead of me. If you get no points and I lose two points, it's the same thing. You're two ahead of me, right? I'm just minus two. So in basketball, we think of a team gets two points, they move ahead. But that's the same as the other team moving behind. So this is the idea of distributive, meaning if one gains, the other loses. And you can't get around that. A lot of people, I think, don't really catch that losing part. They think, well, this team won because they did great. They're winning because they're doing better. They're doing something positive, therefore it's good. But it's the same as the other team losing. So when you do things to win, you're also doing things to make the other side lose. In basketball, the reason it's a good example is there's just no way that at the same time, both sides can get two points. Uh, it's impossible. One side wins those two points, the other side loses. Now, at the end of the game, it may be possible that there's a tie, but even so, we have to have a tiebreaker, right? Eventually, one team wins and one team loses. That's just the way it, it's defined. That's the way the game functions. In order to get ahead into the competition to beat one team so you can play another better team and eventually to become the champions, which is the goal, you have to beat so many teams. You have to make those other teams lose. So this is what we call win-lose. And I think we often consider win-lose to be kind of a negative thing. And, and I'm saying it in a negative way. I feel a little bit uh, bad to even say it this way, right? You have to make the other side lose. Uh, that's how you win. If you win, they lose. So when I say I want to win, it's the same as saying I want the other side to lose. So in negotiation, win-lose is called distributive bargaining. That means that you get two points, it's distributed from the other side. I get two points, it's distributed from you. You give it to one side, but not the other side. Every time one side gains something, the other side loses something, and there's absolutely no way around it. Now, the reason we want to begin talking about this is I want to get your thinking clear on this, and that is you really need to focus on how to win. And I know you think, well, no, we can talk about it, we can work it out, we can make a deal that makes everybody happy. Okay, we're going to talk about that in another unit, and that's possible, but honestly, that's rare. Usually what happens is everyone's trying to win or everyone's trying to make you lose, which is the same thing, right? So I want you to get your mind thinking in this way for this class because we're going to have an RPG, a simulation game, a role-playing game. And in that game, your goal is to win, which is the same as making the other side lose. So I really want you to begin thinking clearly this way. My goal is to get those two points to make the other side to make the other side lose to make my side win okay let's take a look at a dialogue here because in a dialogue we can see uh, a really good example of this now 
Sometimes we have a dialogue with the family and then sometimes we have a dialogue with a business. Let's begin with the family because I want you to see in a very simple way what this is kind of all about. So Fred and Jane are negotiating over a slice of pizza they found uh, in the refrigerator, I guess, leftover pizza, right? That's really common. Jane says, there is only one slice of leftover pizza and there is nothing else in the refrigerator. Fred says, it has been a really busy day today and I'm really hungry. And Jane responds, well, I'm hungry too. And Fred answers, to tell you the truth, I haven't eaten all day. Okay, now, remember, in a negotiation, we need to have two things, right? What do we need to have? We need to have something in common and we need to have something different. What are we finding out here? Fred and Jane have something in common, right? They both want to eat. It's time for dinner and they both want to eat. Now then, they're going to find out they have something that's not in common and that is Fred would like to eat the piece of pizza and Jane would like to eat the pizza pizza, but there's only one piece, so how are they going to do that? Thus, we end up with this distributive idea. It already looks like things are getting distributive. Turn that off. There we go. Fred tries to say, I'm really hungry. I haven't eaten all day. And Jane says, frankly, I don't see how this one slice can satisfy you. Okay, so now we begin to lay out the parameters. What are your goals? And Jane tries to tell Frank, your goal is to eat so that you're not hungry. But hey, this piece of pizza is so small, you'll still be hungry anyway. So if you let me eat it, if you let me eat it, I won't be hungry because I'm smaller than you. I'm shorter than you. I don't need to eat as much as you. But you, maybe you're, you're fat and you want to eat so much. You're not going to be happy anyway, so let me have it. And Fred says, well, you know, I love pizza. Now, so Fred's adding some more. No, well, it's not just that I want to not be hungry. I really like to eat it. And Jane responds, yes, but I kind of like it too. And Fred says, you are being uncooperative. Now here we go with the same idea that we had last unit and that is one side telling the other side they're not working together. They're not trying to find a solution. They're trying to do something to stop the negotiation. Here we say uncooperative. And Jane says you are being inflexible. I think we saw this word in the last unit. Inflexible. You don't want to change. Of course, if we negotiate, both sides have to change something. Otherwise, we'll never come to a conclusion. Okay, now then, let's jump over to a business example. And in a business example, what we're going to look at is the negotiation in a distributive situation. Now, last unit, I think we were looking at planning for negotiation. And now let's just look at a negotiation. So let's begin. Alex and Fred are negotiating and both don't want to give anything. They don't want to give up because if they give up anything, then the other side will get something. And so that'll cause one side to lose and one side to win. And both sides here don't want to lose. So let's take a look at this. A very common situation, they are negotiating over price. Alex says, our price of $25.50 USD per unit is firm. Fred says, unless you lower your price, we can't agree. And Alex responds, this is our bottom line. There is no flexibility in this issue. And Fred says, to be honest, we cannot sell this product in the market at this price. And Alex comes back with, because of our emphasis on quality, we don't have any space to maneuver. This is the lowest we can offer. So you see, both sides are giving a very clear reasons why they can't change, right? 
Alex is saying the price is $25.50. And Fred is saying that's too high, you must lower. And then from then on, they just keep saying, no, I can't. Both sides say they cannot change. Both sides have reasons such as quality, such as market demand. All of these things they keep using as their reason for not wanting to change. So here we can see this must be distributive because both sides are really going strongly to not give in. Fred says we cannot make progress, meaning we cannot come to a conclusion, we cannot finish the negotiation. We cannot make progress if you don't agree to a 20% discount. This is the highest we can offer. Alex says, there is simply no way we can give you a discount. So not only can I not give you 20%, I can't give you any discount. And Fred responds with, if you are so unyielding, same as inflexible, unyielding, this negotiation will reach a deadlock, a deadlock over. Alex responds with, if you don't accept this offer, we will have to withdraw the package. Withdraw means take back so that we have no more negotiation. Take back. Fred responds with, that is an ultimatum. We cannot accept. If you cannot give us a discount, we will have to find another supplier. So here you can see both sides are very firm. Both sides are not giving in anything. And Alex responds, there is no reason to become hostile. The $25.50 price really is our final offer. So don't become hostile, hostile. Meaning don't fight. You don't need to get angry, don't fight. This is, I can't give you anything. Even if you get angry, I can't give you everything, anything you want. I can't give you any discount. So. In this case, we can see they're not making much progress, are they? Okay, let's go on a little bit more here. Fred says, we can agree on the need to wrap up this deal. So, we will offer 21. We cannot make this offer again. So now he changed the price to 21. So he is giving in a little bit. And Alex says, the implication of this price is that we lose 450 on each unit. Although I would like to give you what you want, we cannot take a loss on this deal. Now this is very common, right? Where a buyer or a, especially a seller will say, if I sell for this price, I'm going to lose money. This price is too low, it's under my cost. It's a very normal strategy, many people use this. And Fred says, this is pointless. Our customers simply won't pay more. So even if, even if I give you what you want, I can't make money either. So one side is saying if I sell for so low, I won't make money. And the other side it says if I buy for so high, my customers won't buy and I'll lose money. Okay now, let's jump back over to vocabulary because I think we have some really good vocabulary words here. So let's off and switch over to our vocab. Deadlock. Now deadlock means that we cannot move forward. We are stuck. Dead lock, right? Lock and dead, can't move. So a deadlock negotiation means both sides will not change, cannot move forward. It doesn't mean the negotiation's over. That's another word. But in this case, it just means we can't move forward. We spend time, we talk, but there's no progress. Final offer. This is very often used to say, I'm not going to change anymore. This is my final offer. So one side will tell the other side, this is my final offer. If you don't take it, I will not change anything else. We could also call it the bottom line, which we studied in the previous unit. Firm. This offer is firm. This offer is firm means it's unchangeable. I don't want to change it. I can't change it even if I want to, it's firm. Hostile, hostile or hostile. Hostile means I'm becoming angry or becoming uh, aggressive, very strong or saying unfriendly things. So for example, I think we can accuse the other side of you 
are being uncooperative. You are being inflexible. And when I say that, I'm a little bit hostile. I'm a little bit angry. Maneuver. So maneuver means how much can you change? How much can you move your offer? This could be the buyer or the seller. How much can you maneuver? And of course, one thing you can say is, I cannot maneuver. I have no space to maneuver. I cannot change anything. Pointless. Pointless meaning we cannot make progress. There's no point to keep talking. So this negotiation is pointless. Take a loss. Take a loss meaning that I will lose money. Why would you lose money? If you're a seller, you sell the the, the selling price you sell is under your cost. If you're the buyer, you buy too high, and when you try to sell, you cannot sell it for that much, so you'll take a loss. So it's take a loss, lose money. Ultimatum. Ultimatum means this is the last offer I will give you. If you do not take this offer, there's no more offers. So this is my ultimatum to you. My ultimatum to you is you give me 20% and I will buy 10,000 units. That means you must take this because I will not change. Uncooperative, meaning not cooperating. So uncooperative is you can accuse the other side. You are being uncooperative, meaning you're not helping. Unyielding is the same as uncooperative, only a little bit different. Unyielding just means you won't give up anything. You won't give up anything. We cannot make this offer again. This is a very useful phrase. We cannot make this offer again. Meaning, if you don't take this now, I will not make it again. This is a key point. If I don't, if you don't take it now, so $100 for 1,000 units, this is an offer that I cannot make again. I cannot make this offer again. Okay, you don't want it? Okay, over. I'm done. We're leaving. That's it. See, so we cannot make this offer again, meaning if you don't take it now, we're leaving. We're not going to say it again. Not just not change it, but we're going to actually walk away and not have it anymore. Okay, let's look over at a little bit of a follow-up here and see what we can see. Now when we look at distributive bargaining, what do we see? In distributive bargaining we see that you have basically uh, like a scale here. Here, let me show you here. Nope, not there. Here or maybe, how about here? Here we go. Come over to my monitor here. Yeah, we go. that's nice. Oops, turned off my screen. Okay, there we go. All right, so we have a scale. So on this scale, uh, I put a little picture of a pizza. Now why pizza? Because remember, Fred and Jane were arguing about the pizza, right? Now, why is pizza a good example of this? Well, on the scale, you see, if one side goes up, the other side goes down. If one side goes down, the other side goes up. That's distributive bargaining. Anytime this side goes up, the other side goes down. What one side wins, the other side loses. What one side loses, the other side wins. So you win, I lose. I win, you lose. So that's what distributive bargaining is. Both sides are in direct conflict, and there's really not a lot you can do to change that. The resources are fixed. What does it mean to be fixed? Just like in this picture here, it's a pizza. It's a round pizza. There's no more pizza, that's it. We cannot go buy more, there's no more. We gotta split up this pizza. If you get one piece, I get one piece less. If I get one piece, you get one piece less. So in the case of Jane and Fred, that was extreme. They only have one little tiny piece. But same thing, if they cut it in half, one person gets half, the other person gets, gets half. Would that be okay? Well, no because Fred and Jane want to be full. They want to eat enough so that they're not hungry, and half is not enough. So they both want to eat the whole piece. In any case, uh, Fred wants more and Jane wants more. They both want more. 
So someone is going to have to win and somebody's going to have to lose. And you say, well, Professor Warden, what if they just cut the pizza in half and they both are a little bit happy? Isn't that good? I mean, yeah, they still might be hungry, but at least Fred gets a little bit and Jane gets a little bit. And the answer to that is, in that case, yes, you're right. Fred will get a little bit and Jane will get a little bit. And Fred will be a little bit less hungry and Jane will be a little bit less hungry. But in this way, they're both still hungry, so they both lose. So thinking win-win is not so easy. Just cutting something in half does not mean win-win. That just means I half get half of what I want, which is the same as uh, losing, <laughs> right? It's the same as losing. And in distributive bargaining, both sides do not want to lose. And later when we study win-win, both sides don't want to lose either. It's not just cutting something in half. That is not the way it works. So in this case, I use the scale to show one side goes up, one side goes down. There's just no way to stop it. Or the pizza. If you get something, I get something less. And in Fred and Jane's case, a very small amount. So that they're both going to end up being hungry no matter what we do. Okay, so I think I kind of made the point there clear. For the buyer, a distributive negotiation begins with what the best deal is, the target point. Now, let's begin looking at this very, very uh, carefully, step by step, because I want you to remember this because it's really key idea, right? Very, very important. So if you're the buyer, a distributive negotiation begins with the best deal, which means getting the lowest price, right? I want to buy at the lowest price, okay? So I want to buy this cup and I want to get the lowest price. If this cup costs $100, then I would like to get less than 100 and lower is better, right, if I am the buyer. So the target point is the best deal and the worst deal is still acceptable. That's called the resistance point. So let's say this cup here, this cup Maybe the retail price, the sticker price is 100. Okay, whatever, it doesn't really matter to me. I have my price. So for me, what is my target price? Well, if I could pay 50, that is what I would like to pay. Of course, I'd like to pay zero, right? But remember what we talked about in the previous units that I need to have what is my target. So in this case, let's say my target is 50. Okay, now then. I'm the buyer, so I would like to go lower. So 50 is my target price. That's my target point. Now, how much does the price go up and I'm not gonna buy? 50 is what, I, what I'm targeting, target point. Of course, if it could be lower than 50, I'm happy too, that's fine, right? But 50 is my target. Now, how much higher does the price go and I'm just not going to buy it if it goes higher. In that case, let's say that my upper price, my resistance point, I will not, I will not go past the resistance point. Let's say that my resistance point is, uh, let's say 80, okay? The, the, the sticker price may be 100, we don't care. That's, the sticker price is not important. The retail price is not important to us. If, if that retail price is 100, that is over my resistance point of 80. So if somebody tells me you must pay the price that's on there, the sticker price, the retail price, the list price, I'm going to say no, I don't want to spend that because that is over my resistance. So we have two things here, target and resistance. I want you to remember. So the resistance point for the buyer is the highest price I will pay. Higher than that, I will not buy, right? Higher than that, I will not buy. The target point is the desired price, for me, 50. Anything beyond the resistance point cannot be accepted, 80. If it's $81, I will not accept it. If it's $82, I will not accept it. If it's $90, no. If it's $100, no. If it's $79, 
then yes, I can accept that. That doesn't mean I will accept it, but I can accept that. If it's $80, can I accept that? Yes, that's my, that is my actual resistance point, right? But 81, no. Both the target point and the resistance point are secret information that you should not tell the seller. Now here we get into the next important point in negotiation, and that is this idea of secret information. So this is the cup I wanna buy. This cup, I want to buy it for 50. That's my target, my target point. The most I will pay is 80. So 50 to 80 in here, right? If you are going to sell to me, and I told you, sir, I would like to buy that cup. And I would like to buy that cup somewhere from 50 to 80. And what would you say to me? You would say, oh, no problem, 80. And then what would I say? Well, 80, okay, 80, because 80 is still within my resistance, right? Resistance point, target point, resistance, it's inside. Now that was pretty stupid of me to tell you that, right? I should just tell you that 100 is way too much, I'm not gonna spend that much. And then you say, well, how much do you want? And then maybe I begin by saying, how much do I want? Maybe I begin by saying 40. And then we can work up like that, right? So we begin with two ideas here. Both of them are secret. Resistance point and target point. Please remember those. Those are so awesomely up here, right? Resistance point and target point, okay? Secret information. You never want to tell the other side. In this case, the seller. You never want to tell the seller. Okay, now then, let's change perspective a little bit. Now the seller is a little bit different, right? If the seller is selling this cup, then the seller must begin with a price, right? Because he's selling it. I mean, you cannot go and ask, I would like to buy that cup, how much is it? And the seller says, hmm, I don't know. How much money do you have? Right, That's, that doesn't work, right? No, I don't think that works. Although there are some companies that do that kind of thing. So if, if you come to me and you say, Mr. Warden, I'd like to buy that cup. And I say, hmm, the price of this cup, let me tell you, how much money is in your pocket right now? Uh, I don't think that would be a good way to begin. What do we normally begin with? Normally, you go to the, the seller and there's a price there, a sticker price or a list price or a retail price and that price is listed there. Or you can ask me and I tell you, 100. This cup is 100. So the seller must always begin. The seller must always begin with some public information. And that public information is gonna be the price. So we call this the seller's asking price. The seller's asking price. Okay, now, after the seller's asking price, what comes next? Let's take a look. At the start of the negotiation, one value is public. Everyone can see it, while two values are secret. So the asking price, the selling price, the retail price, the list price, this in fact is public. Two other values are secret, but we'll talk about that in a second. So, the first step is for the buyer to decide how much to offer for the initial starting offer, right? So, if I go to buy the cup and the list price is 100, I must decide what do I say to begin with? Do I say zero? You should give me that cup for free, please. <laughs> well. I can't start with, I guess I could start with zero, but no one's gonna take me serious, right? So what do I begin with? That's going to be the opening or first offer. 
The first offer needs to be lower than the target. Remember my target, right? Remember my target? My target was 50. Since the seller will try to raise the price, the seller will always try to make the price go up. So the buyer should begin under the target. If my target is 50, I would like to get 50. How do I get 50? I must begin below 50. I say, I'll give you 40. So here we have this little chart. And I like this a lot. We can see on this graph here, on this line, we have three things so far. On the right side, we have the buyer's resistance point. That is, I will not spend more than this. In my case, the example was 80. I will not spend more than 80. Then you have the buyer's target point. In my case, was 50 for the cup. So I will spend more. I will, I will definitely spend less than this. I'm happy to spend less. The question is, though, what do I want to get? I wanted to get 80. And then we have the first offer. So maybe I begin my offer down around 40. And then in this chart here, we have a different example. So we have 12,000 is the buyer's resistance point. More than 12,000, too much. He wants to get 9,000. So where does he begin? He begins down around 7,500. And the one more piece of information there is what? It's the seller's asking price. That's public information, isn't it? The seller's asking price. Okay, so I really like you to look carefully at this, uh, whoops, there we go, turn on my screen again. Very sensitive the screen is. I want you to look very carefully in your book at this and begin to understand the difference between the buyer and the seller. I think it's easy for you to understand. I think you, you do it every day, you understand it. But the problem is I want you to really see that this information has to stay secret. You really must think, what is my target? We talked about this last time, didn't we? What is it that is my target? How do I decide if I win or if I lose? How do I decide if I do a good job or a bad job? You have to have your target clear. Your resistance, right? So your target to your resistance. If the price keeps going up to your resistance, well then, that's not so good for you, but after some point, that resistance point, you will not buy at all. So this range here must stay secret. If the buyer's first offer is too low for the seller, then the seller will not want to sell. So now we begin to look at this. How do you begin? you begin lower than your target. How much lower? How much lower? And my answer is, well, if you go too low, the buyer will say, huh, that is just so low, forget it. I don't want to talk to you, right? So you don't want to go that low, but you don't want to go over your target. This means the first offer must be higher than the seller's resistance point. Ah, so now we bring in the seller's resistance point. Remember the buyer's resistance point? That is the highest price the buyer will pay. Higher than that is too high. What about the seller's resistance point? Well, the seller is different. The seller would like the price to go up and up and up. The buyer would like the price to go down and down and down. So for the seller, if the price goes too low, the seller will lose money. So the seller has a resistance point also. What is that? That's the lowest price the seller will sell for. However, this lowest price the seller will sell for, it's secret. It's secret. He's not going to tell you what it is. I mean, he may say that he knows, he may tell you something, but it will not necessarily be true. So this is the seller's resistance point. And for the seller's resistance point and the buyer's resistance point, they are apart, they are not together. I mean, usually they'd be apart. If they're together, there's no negotiation, everything's already agreed upon. So they are apart.
Now this area between the two is what we call the negotiation zone or the bargaining range. Let's take a look at this slide here very quickly. So let's take a look at the buyer's view. If the price is too low for the seller, he or she will walk away from the negotiation. If the price is too high for the buyer, he or she will walk away from the negotiation. Look at this picture. So if you look at the very bottom, that's called the bargaining range, the bargaining range. The bargaining range meaning we can have the price go all the way down in this example to 7,000 or the price could go all the way up to 12,000. So 7,000 to 12,000 is the bargaining range. Lower than 7,000, if the price goes under 7,000, guess what? That price is too low for the seller. That price is too low for the seller. That means the buyer's offer is too low. What does too low mean? It means the seller just says, nope, I don't want to talk to you. Negotiation over. How about the other end? 12,000. Can the price go over 12,000? No. Why? Because if the price is over 12,000, that price is too high for the buyer. Too high for the buyer. That means the seller's offer is too high. The seller wants too much. The seller wants the price too high. The buyer cannot agree. So those are the two resistance points. Seller's resistance point and the buyer's resistance point. If you go beyond these, there's no deal. So we must stay within these. The problem is the buyer's resistance point is secret information and the seller's resistance point is secret information. So we need to guess where they are. What do we have inside there? At 9,000 we have the buyer's target, right? That's what he would like to get. And we also have the seller's asking price. That's the price he would like to get. That's not secret. That's the one piece of information that's public, not secret. Each side must have their own goals clear. And guess what the other side's secrets are? Now this is another thing that I want you to think about in negotiation. Remember, today I'm emphasizing you want to win. How do you win? You win by winning or you win by making the other side lose. Same thing. Another key point today, which sounds, again, it sounds not nice, and that is you want to keep your information secret. I want to keep my information secret but you want to get the other side's secret information out. How do you get it? There are many ways and none of them are too good. They're all kind of trick the other side, fool the other side, make them say something they don't mean to say, get them confused, get that information. Of course, they don't want to give it to you, so you need to get it somehow. So that's how you can win. How do you win? Keep your information secret and get the other side's information out. Get their secret information to not be secret anymore. I know you're saying, oh, Professor Warden, this is also terrible. We should be nice to each other. And I'm saying, okay, you can do that and you will be the one who loses in the negotiation. The buyer's first offer must not be below the seller's resistance point. So the buyer wants to begin low price, right? How low? Well, I don't know, but not too low. Because if it's too low, then game over. Higher than the seller's target point, the seller will agree to the offer quickly. So if you go high, if you go high, then the seller may say, yep, no problem. And that always happens, doesn't it? That always happens when you go somewhere and you say something like, I'd like to buy that cup. How much is it? And he says, it's $100. And I say, well, I'll give you 90. And he says, okay, 90. And what do I say? I say oh, 90. Why did I agree so fast? I could have got it for 80, right? So if you go high, high enough, right? Then you're going to be past that target of the past the target of the seller. 
And the seller will happy to give it to you because it's over the target, no problem. So here we have the chart again. Look at this closely with me. Stick with me, try to follow this. A little bit confusing, right? But I think you can do it. So what we have over here is the two ends. On the left end, buyers offer too low. Buyers offer too low. That means the price is too low. The seller will not sell. What's on the right side? The right side, on the right side is sellers offer too high. Sellers offer too high. So this is the bargaining range, the bargaining range, right? We can't go outside this range, otherwise nothing will work right. Nothing will happen, no one will agree. Okay, you can see here some things are secret. So the buyer's resistance point is secret. The buyer's target point is secret. That should be you if you're the buyer. And what about the seller? Well, you need to guess the seller's resistance point. And you need to guess the seller's target. He's not going to tell you what they are. Now, here's an interesting one right here that we've kind of talked about but not really focused on so far. So that's this seller's target point. So this is what the seller would like to get for the price. But what about the list price? Here's the list price. This is the sticker price. That's the sticker price. Well, guess what? The sticker price, the asking price, the retail price is higher than the target point, the target price. Why does the seller make the price higher than what he wants? Why does he do that? Because he knows that the buyer is going to push the price down, right? So what does he do? He begins higher. He begins further up. So what about the, the buyer? Same thing. He begins low. Why begin low? Because he knows he's going to be pushed up in price. Okay, so let's take a look at this carefully together to make sure we really have a good grip of it. Okay, so we come back to look at this picture one more time because I want to really emphasize how important this idea is and to get you thinking in a way that really understands what is this bargaining range, what are the resistance points. So let me go ahead and jump back to our slide here a bit and spend a little bit of time trying to specify, mm, clarify, I guess I should say, a little bit on this. Okay, now the key point to begin with is what is the bargaining range, right? So our bargaining range begins at the seller's high end, which is the resistance point for the, oops, let me change my mouse here, resistance point for the buyer over on this side, and then the resistance point for the seller over on this end over here. So with these two ends in place, we need to remember that the negotiation will not take place if you're outside. So if you're way over here, or you're way over here, it's not gonna happen, right? Why is it gonna happen? It's gonna happen because we're inside the bargaining range. So that's the first point. And then what's another important point? Let me change to my highlighter here. I think the key point here is what is your secret information? Secret information. Why is secret information so important? Because secret information means if the other side knows, well then it's game over, you're doomed. Because if I know the buyer's resistance point and I'm the seller, I'm going to go as close as I can to that resistance point. On the other hand, the reverse is also true. If I'm the buyer and I'm trying to uh, buy from the seller and I know the seller's resistance point, I'm going to push as close as I can to that resistance point. 
So the resistance points must be secret. Also the targets must be secret. That is, what is the goal? What is the goal package? This all must remain fairly secret. Now you can say what you want. You can tell the buyer, I want to buy this product. You can tell the buyer the price you want, but you don't want that to be your real target. You need to go outside, away from that, because they're gonna push you back. So the reason I like this picture so much, the reason I like this chart so much, is that this chart really gives us that, that clear feeling of, here are the points to begin with, here are the points to begin with, here are the stages inside. It's not as simple as just saying, I get as low as possible, like zero. I always ask people, how low do you want? They say, well, lower is better, right? I say, well, that's true, lower is better, but look, if you go too low, the negotiation will not even happen. They won't take you serious. They won't negotiate, they'll withdraw. And the same, the same is true on the other side, too high. So we've got these points at the end, then we have these points inside, the target points. So those target points, secret, very secret. If you let that out, it's game over, you're going to lose. So please take a look at this graphic very carefully and don't be intimidated by, by it, thinking, well, it's too complicated. It's not really complicated, but on the other hand, if you understand it, don't just walk away and say, well, I got it, I understand, I can draw a picture if I take a test. No, it's not about taking a test. It's about making your plan for your negotiation so that you know what are your beginning points, what are your resistance points, guessing what the other side's resistance point is, guessing what the other side's target is, knowing what your target is, and then beginning your negotiation in this way, away from your target, moving up towards your target, being careful. Did you pass your target? Now you have to watch out, don't pass your resistance point, and measuring these things as you negotiate. This is especially true when you have multiple opportunities. You may have multiple buyers that you're selling to, or you may have different sellers that you can buy from. So you can choose them. So you can go to each one of them and negotiate by having this very clear picture. You can then decide who gives you the better deal, who gives you the better result. But how do you know that if you don't have your idea is very clear. If you don't have your resistance and target points, and before that, your goal package. If you don't know any of these things, if you don't know what is my goal package, then you cannot possibly make this. And if you don't make this, then when you go to negotiate, all you're thinking is, what's my goal package? That's what I want. That's kind of like hit or miss. I get 100% or I get nothing. No, that's not the way negotiation works. Probably you're gonna get some things you want, you're gonna lose some things you want. But how do you get the most? How do you get more in distributive bargaining because you get something, the other side loses something, you need to have your goal package ready, you need to be very clear, then you need to lay this out clearly, know your resistance point, know your target point, and guess, see if you can guess the other side's resistance point and the other side's target point. If you do that and you keep your information secret, you'll have a better chance to win more in the distributive bargaining. If you let your secret out, you're going to lose in distributive bargaining. All right, good luck with your negotiation.